Well, let's also take a look at, and one of the other important things are, the sort of scales of distance and the scales of time that we encounter in the ocean. We are in, interested in investigating things as small as bacteria, and smaller, really, all the way up to giant whales. We may also be looking at processes that are happening on the order of seconds to processes that are happening on the order of centuries. How do we put all this stuff together? The ocean varies over tenfold scales of time and space, and trying to look at all those different scales and trying to connect all those different scales is one of the challenges of oceanography. Just for those of you that may not be familiar with the terms, when I talk about spatial scales, I'm talking about scales of space. When I talk about temporal scales, I'm talking about scales of time. And scale simply means the progression of something. So inches, feet, uh, miles, those are the scales of distance. Seconds, hours, centuries are some of the scales of time, as we'll see in just a few minutes. On the inside front cover of your book is a picture that somewhat illustrates this. And this is really kind of an abstract picture for students, but I suggest you return to it every now and then. But do take a look at it now. This lists the scales of space along with the scales of time and the kinds of things that oceanographers might be interested in, the kinds of things that happen over these scales of time and space. And I don't want to beat this over the head, but we will come back to this theme of the importance of observing scales of time and space throughout the semester. And again, it represents one of the major challenges that oceanographers face. So this is the same figure you'll find on the inside front cover of your book. Scales and temporal, spatial and temporal scales of variability in the world ocean. And again, I suggest that you take a look at that. If we think about scales of space, we might look from as small as the sand on a beach to a coastline to the kinds of things we see from outer space. Those are the kinds of variability and properties over scales of space that are of interest to oceanographers. Length, width, height, and depth, latitude, longitude, elevation, all those kinds of things are important. And of course, when we start talking about these kinds of things, we talk about units. So the ones we're most familiar with are the unit U.S. units, inches, feet, yards, and miles. But we also have metric units, and we will interchange between those because in some cases metric units are useful to us. Millimeters, centimeters, meters, and kilometers. A kilometer is about 0.6 miles. And if you've been watching the Olympics at all, kilometers are probably the kinds of units you've heard more about than anything else. And in the back of the book, table A.2, you'll find some of these units and some of the conversions listed. And again, I suggest you take a look at that uh, just to familiarize yourself with where those conversions are and where those units are for when you need to look it up. If we think about scales of time, we might think about just spending some time at the beach. Every few seconds, a wave comes in. Well, those are scales on orders of seconds. We have scales on the orders of minutes. The tides are on scales of hours. All these things are happening at the ocean at the same time. And fortunately, scales of time are in somewhat universal units. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries, and millennia. And oceanographers, just like many other kinds of Earth scientists, are interested in processes that happen over all of these different time scales. And Table A.7 in the back of your book in the appendix will give you a list of some of these units and some of the conversions and help you uh, become familiar with those types of units and scales. Okay, if we think about some of the things that we get from the ocean, the list is really long and, and plentiful and really 
kind of makes us smile. If you look at Table 1.1 in Chapter 1 of the book, um, you can see that humans depend on the world ocean for a variety of different things. Energy resources, mineral resources, biological resources. If you eat anything from the sea, you're depending on that from the sea. Some of the biological resources you may not even be familiar with. Toothpaste, which hopefully all of you use on a daily basis, contains some parts of kelp plants. Seaweeds, in fact. Didn't know you were putting seaweed in your mouth every morning, did you? Mmm, tasty. In any case, ocean-related economies employ millions of people. They're worth billions of dollars. So, of course, the ocean is really trillions of dollars. In fact, uh, the ocean economy is really important to us. And one thing that we'll get into this semester are the fact that the ocean really keeps us alive. It provides a warm climate for us to live in. It provides oxygen for us. It makes our planet habitable. And for many, if not most people of the world, it feeds them. So we'll talk a lot about resources and the kinds of things. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the things we just enjoy about the ocean. And probably the first thing that attracted you to this class were some of the things that you enjoy about the world ocean. Just being by the ocean, by surfing or boating or just sitting on the beach. All those kinds of things are reasons that people express for signing up for an oceanography course in the first place. We seek the world ocean for recreation and relaxation. Philosophers, poets, artists, many people have been inspired by the ocean. We'll take a look at that throughout the semester. We have lots of room to talk about um, the ways that the ocean impact and move us personally as well. Of course, students have always found the ocean an ideal place to learn about the world. So, welcome to the world ocean. The good always comes with the bad, or vice versa. Human impacts on the world ocean, unfortunately, are large. And in fact, the world ocean may be in trouble in many different ways that we're going to study this semester. Humans overfish the ocean. Of course, you've heard about global warming, which I consider to be the number one enemy of the ocean and humanity's survival. Habitat destruction, uh, invasive species, all these kinds of things are impacting the ocean in negative ways and we're going to talk about that but you can look at table 1.2 and we'll, and we'll take a closer look at that throughout the semester to get some idea of the other kinds of things that are going on in the world ocean the way that humans are impacting it in a negative way. Some scientists actually believe that the problem, the human impacts on the world ocean have reached crisis proportions. Admiral James D. Watkins is quoted as saying, we have a historic opportunity to make a positive and lasting change in the way we manage the world ocean before it is too late. So with all this sort of negative stuff about the ocean, we can also think about our role and begin to take positive steps to improve the health and condition of the ocean. If you're interested in some further exploration, I want to check out the exploration, act, exploration activity in the end of the chapter. The textbook has a website you'll find useful. And if you get a hold of a copy of The Living Sea, it's my favorite IMAX movie on the ocean with music by Sting and narrated by Meryl Streep. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you.